there was a terror attack well, as close as you are to me to the shooter you saw him pick up this oh, machine, machine no gun way. ak-47 oh and then he just started shooting oh everybody there's a three-year-old five-year-old ten-year-old oh, no. all dead in front of us and i saw it all and today we have damien merry the owner of luxury property partners yeah, you'll never see way. my social media me saying can i sell your house or like, like yeah, i never yeah. do it i'm just constantly trying to provide value but when i go for it the close rate 90 95 percent. what's the most challenging decision you've ever had to make in business leave a seven figure business to nothing when i scroll through tiktok tiktok is junk npcs they're like thank you for the rose thank you for the oh, rose yeah. and i'm like there is so much crap on tiktok and everyone's like you'll never sell a house on tiktok and I I sold my biggest profit, 31 million. The video was seen through TikTok from the daughter and then went straight to the dad and then he ended up buying the property. TV show called Take Me Out. Seems a good way to end a podcast. Good evening, ladies. I'm Damien and I'm from Western Superman. <laughs> wish well, you started with this. Um, yeah. yeah, so I think it was... Hello and welcome to episode 20 of the GV podcast and today we have Damien Merry, the owner of Luxury Property Partners. Thanks for coming on our show. Thank you for having me. If you guys don't already know, Damien hosts one of the largest um, social media accounts for luxury houses and lettings, right? Correct. So tell us a little bit about yourself. How did it all start? My journey was uh, it's pretty in-depth, it's pretty emotional, so I'll try and keep it as brief as possible. Um, born and raised in Plymouth, Devon. Uh, real fascination and passion for business and marketing so I did my A-levels in business and marketing went to Plymouth University the same uh, then I became a model for a few years did some stuff for Gucci all the way down to DFS sofas so a bit of a range from the old modeling days um, really enjoyed that but had a real passion for business and sales didn't really know what I was going to do I was kind of in my in my early 20s one of the modeling jobs was to sell uh, luxury gazebos at all these big f Chelsea flower shows, Hampton flower show, all this kind of stuff. So never done sales before. They were like £20,000 gazebos, which is obviously pretty pricey for the UK. Um, I think I sold eight in my first trade show. I made about five to six grand, I think, in, a, in, in my first show, which was really, really good. Um, become their top sales guy. And it happened by accident because I was there as a, I guess back then, relatively decent looking guy who you know, could speak and talk and, you know, sounded pretty educated. Um, so it was supposed to be kind of like a promotional model role, but it actually ended up, I, I actually ended up being a really good sales guy for this company. Stayed there for five years. Um, they were turning over maybe five to 10 mil a year. And I was probably be, uh, responsible for maybe 70% of that, oh, wow. but only earning 75 pound per gazebo. Oh, wow. And selling them for like 20, 30 grand. And I, was, I just thought... A gazebo for 20, 30 grand? Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah, so it got to a point where myself and my, my best friend, Simon, uh, in the US, we... Th uh, no, he's not from the US, sorry. We, we, we were looking at different places where we could do this. Mm. Um, and we looked all over the world, Australia, China, the US. And then uh, we said, instead of doing this in the UK and competing with this current company, let's take it to the US and uh, do it over there. So we did. Oh, well, so you've shifted all the way to the US. Yeah, so I went from being a sales guy to a carpenter stroke sales guy. Oh, wow. Built two of these gazebos in our garage. Took us about six weeks. Mm. Spent about 30 grand building them. And then uh, got a shipping container. Shipped them over to the US. Booked five home shows. Nice. Booked a house in the middle of the ghetto in California next to Mexican cartel on one side. Oh, wow. God knows whatever the guy was doing on the, on the other side. <laughs> but we came really friendly with him. Really? Like, oh, my God, you guys are English? And we're like, yeah. And he was like so cool bro and I was like yeah, yeah. guns everywhere and I was like Jesus oh Christ so God. yeah so we did that and then uh year one we sold like six gazebos turned over like a hundred thousand dollars terrible because there was four of us that went there to live this American dream um and then we just progressed and progressed year five eight million dollars oh my Picked up by a billionaire and featured on CNBC, which is primetime TV That's over brilliant. there. Yeah, it was it was huge. So he invested in our company, um, which was fantastic. And then we had exposure all over the US. So we came became these like English superstars. Oh, amazing. Yeah, and they just they just loved us, like the accent and everything else. They yeah. were just like, You guys related to One Direction? Do you know the Queen? <laughs> but we were like, no, clearly not. Um 
And then uh, we set up at one of these trade shows in Santa Barbara, Garlic Festival. Yeah. And unfortunately, probably one of the worst things you could ever imagine, it was a, there was a terror attack. And I was maybe, well, as close as you are to me. Oh, my God. To the, to the shooter. No way. Wow. Yeah. So there was probably 20,000 people that way. And these yeah. big white um, marquee things all eating their lunch. It was a nice show. It was that really high-end garlic festival. It was, it was cool. Really nice show. And this kid, he was just... Um, he had this backpack and he was kind of taking everything out and put a balaclava on and I was with my friend and I said this is clearly part of the show right I was like what the hell is going on and he was like I'm out he, he just he legged it he ran oh, your friend already knew he was gone he was gone and I was oh. like no it's fine and then you saw him pick up this oh, machine, machine gun no AK-47 oh basically and I was like okay this is clearly terrible what's about to happen and then he just started shooting oh everybody and I saw it all there was a I don't want to be too graphic, but it was a three-year-old, five-year-old, ten-year-old, oh, no. all dead in front of us. What, what did you do in the moment? Um, well, he ran like a... Well, he probably did the right thing, but because we were in this big gazebo, it's probably the size of this room where we all are. Yeah. There was a lot of young kids running around screaming, and I was like, get in the gazebo, get in the gazebo. We had like sofas like this. I was like, get behind. We had this big cabinet. I remember putting this like eight-year-old girl in this cabinet. I was like, just get in there, just hide, just hide. Um... And then just ducked down, basically. And the shooting stopped. And I was like, oh, thank God for that. I'd say that's quite heroic of you. When you've got other people oh, running was, out of the building. It was terrifying, but I couldn't move. Help people. I was thinking if I left the gazebo, who's going to see me anyway? So I was yeah. just like, just get everybody in here, you know, jump on these kids and help them out. Um, and then the shooting stopped. And I was like, oh, thank God for that. And then 30 seconds later, bang, 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 bang really? again. And I was like, oh my God, oh this my is God. terrifying. And then all of a sudden you see like 20 of these massive cops, like police guys just running towards this guy. And then uh, this guy, he just gets his own gun. Uh, he's got a handgun at this point and just shoots himself in the head. Wow. And I was like, what am I watching right now? So like I feel my phone, movie, um, I say, yeah. and my phone was going nuts in my pocket. I was looking yeah. at it. My wife, like 70 missed calls. And I was like, I'll call you back. I'll call you back. She was like, tell me you're alive, tell me you're alive. And I was like, obviously I'm answering the phone. She was like, I'm watching this on the news. And I was like, oh Jesus, it was like that's worldwide insane. news at that point. And I was Surely just, that's one of the main reasons why you want to get out of the country. It's oh, she such was a like, common thing there. We, we were there for eight years and she said to me at that point, I love you, we've got three daughters, the suitcases are packed. I'm oh, going wow. tomorrow. Seriously. Yeah. And this was like an hour after it happened. I was like, the chance of this, I said, like, can I just like, um, digest this and she was like I'm going oh, literally on the day yeah yeah she was like I'm going she, she going. didn't she went like yeah. a, f a few days later but it's crazy right like because I think the Americans just I don't know I think they've almost come to terms with that is part of normal life right mm -hmm. yeah that, okay th I, I think I was reading that when that happened that was like the 240th mass shooting yeah. in, you know, the, a short span of time mm -hmm. or something crazy like that. Well, they train the kids at school. They yeah. call it uh, practice for like a, a deer or something. And I'm like, what is this? So they just say, imagine a deer is running into the school. Everybody's got to hide behind the tables. Everybody's got to do this. What they're training them to do is if a shooter comes into the school... This is how you have to react. Oh. That's insane. And my wife was having none of that. I mean, you, you'd expect that from something like a third world country. But yeah. this is the States, one of the, the mm. highest earning countries in the world, one of the most glorified countries in the world. And this yeah. is such a common occurrence. Yeah. that is. And, but, and for him to go and shoot on kids, that's just, you've got to be quite twisted. Yeah, it, it was terrifying. And, mm. you know, I, I got to the point where I had to run away from the situation. But because business was so important to me and I had clients that I sold gazebos for at the show, I had to go back to the gazebo. Yeah, and see all of this like bloodshed and everything around me. But I, one, I needed my car keys because I needed to leave, and two, I had order forms that I needed to get into production. Um, so I had a very successful time over there. We were, you know, it was a seven-figure business. Really, really happy. Loved California. Um, but my wife, she always said to me, five years max, then we need to come back to the UK." Yeah. So we were there for eight years. I think we were always looking for reasons to come back. That was obviously a major one. Mm. Um, and then I was, uh, you know, she left and then I, I had to sell my business, had to sell some tools, basically get some cash together as much as I could. Um, and I just thought to myself, what the hell am I going to do back in the UK? I've been, you know, I'm established over here now for eight years, covered in tattoos, living this kind of like Californian cool life, being an English guy over there. Um, and then I just had to go into like the job sites and I was like, what am I going to do in the UK? And I was looking through all this stuff and salaries and everything and I was like how am I going to do any of this stuff like mm. going from earning x to earning maybe 
you know, no offense to anybody, but going from earning, I don't know, 250 a year to earning 20, 30 grand, I was like, this is gonna, this is gonna ruin me. What am I gonna do? Um, and then I saw an advert for luxury self employed real estate agent with Fine and Country. Be your own boss. We're looking for entrepreneurs, we're looking for marketers, all that kind of stuff. And I was like, yeah, this kind of fits. Um, so I called the owner. So Finding Country is like an equi- equivalent to Knight Frank yeah. or something like that. You've got Knight okay. Frank, Savills, Finding Country, a couple of right. other big boys. And I thought, yeah, that would suit me perfectly because I'm can. i I'm almost in control of my own destiny. Yeah, I've been around construction. I've been around multimillionaires and billionaires. So I don't really get intimidated by people with money and not in a disrespectful way. But I've always been very good at business and just kind of talking straight with people, whether they've got... You know, I had Mark Zuckerberg. He was one of my clients. In no the US. way. For so, gazebo? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He had what was big, he like? He was cool, actually. He was just playing badminton on his, uh, with, his, with his wife. And he yeah. was like so blasé about it. He bought the biggest one we do as a golf simulator, basically. So, so you had gone pitched him while he was playing badminton? No, his assistant bought it. Okay, she came okay. to one of these shows and she was like, what's the biggest and best one you do? Okay. And can you make it into a golf simulator? And I was like, well, they're really for like hot tubs, TVs, sofas and everything. And she was like doesn't matter what it costs, build it and bring it. Oh, wow. And I was like, okay, no problem. And we got there. Crazy driveway. It was probably two miles long. The biggest house I've ever seen. No way. And there was just a couple playing badminton. And all the guys in the truck, they were like, oh, can I swear on here? Yeah. yeah. Shit. And I was like, <laughs> oh, shit. It's Mark Tucker. <laughs> yeah. um, and uh, so he was just a really cool. He just kind of let us get on with it. So I was kind of used to dealing with people like that. What was the craziest request, or, or was that the, the the biggest job that you ever done with? The no, there was a really weird request for yeah. a uh, like a nudist camp, and they wanted us to build something. And the beams that we put in the ceiling had to be strong enough to hold swings. And I was like, I don't want to know anything else, but yeah. we'll build it. Yeah. <laughs> and then it turned out it was on this video and I was just like, oh my God, we built that. And you could actually see what was happening in there. And I was like, where, where, you where clearly followed the... it, by the way, if you saw the video. Oh, you saw it? No, I was saying you clearly followed it if you saw the video. <laughs> <laughs> no, okay, good. Um, so then you, you came and started working for Finding Country. And then... Yeah. Well, I basically taught myself for the last eight weeks in the US, what is real estate? You know, because I had no idea what it was. So it was, and I think the good thing about the the era that we live in now, you've got access to so much stuff on YouTube. You can just teach yourself anything, I think. Yeah. Um, so I was just learning about conveyancing, um, what is a state agency, what does it take to be a real estate agent, all this kind of stuff. And then following the big boys in the US, like Gary V. I I follow him religiously. And then you've got Tom Panos and Josh Fegan in, in Australia, who are big coaches. And I was just learning what they what they did. But there was nobody to follow in the UK. And I was like, how the hell is this possible? Because in the US, they charge 6%. In the UK, average fees like 0.75%. Really? And I'm like, there's is got to be somebody good in the UK to follow. Difference. That's crazy. It's, it's massive. So I but talk myself. then again, you see all this uh, selling sunset and mm-hmm. whatnot. And then it's like, they're selling a 15 million pound property. And the, the, the commissions on it is what? Something like... Half a million quid mm-hmm. or something. Yeah. Is it, am I right? Is that yeah, that, I mean, they're, they're driving cars like, you know, the regular real estate agents have these cars. Yeah, yeah. And then I come over here and it's just like, you know, the average salary is 15K. You might get a £200 bonus if you sell a house. It's a race at the bottom on fees. And so what, why, what do you put the difference to? Like, wh- why do you think there's such a big disparity between what they get paid out there and what we get paid down there? I think Americans are very, I don't want to say over the top, but they're very passionate Mm. And they love to market. They love to have drones. They love to do these walkthrough tours. They like the twilight stuff. They have these big agents days where everyone's like their champagne. And they've got buyers agents and sellers agents. Okay. But in the UK, it's just, I'm the agent. I'm 1% fee. Get off my listing. I want to sell it as quickly as possible. But in the US, they're like, selling this for another million is another 100 grand for me. So their mindset is, let me sell it for more. Let me give it global exposure. But yeah. in the UK, it's... Let me sit in my office nine till five, wait for the phone to ring, stick it on right move, hope for the best. So it's, re- it's broken over here. Wow. So I thought mm. I've got a really good opportunity here to, to make something of myself. And that was uh, three years ago. One thing you mentioned about these um, brokers in, in the States driving around in these cars, I've always thought that, let's say if <clears> I was looking to sell a house that was worth 10 million, or I'm looking to go and buy a house that's worth 10 million, and I see a broker turn up in a supercar, straight away I'd start thinking I'd want to negotiate on the price. So I'd start thinking they're earning a bit too much. I mean, how, how do you tackle things like that? So my dream car was a, a Ventador. 
um, and coming back with a bit of money from the US to the UK, I wasn't able to get a house. I'm basically a ghost in the UK because I've been away for eight years. So it was like, you know, I came back with a couple hundred K and I was like, you know, that'll support me and my wife and kids for a little bit until I figure it out. So I had a bit of a cushion. I uh, went to the bank. They said, no, we can't give you a mortgage. And I was like, do I have the just the cash sat in the bank or do I enjoy it a little bit? You know, coming from California back to the UK, I, wa I wanted something to make me feel good, especially after that shooting. It was like, it wasn't an ego thing or anything, get in the car, but it was just like, I want, I want something. And all these real estate agents in the US having those cars, but people welcome it. Over there, they're like, my God, he's got a Rolls Royce. He's good. They look up to mm. He's got a Lamborghini. He's good. You know, all of this. They, they wear nice suits. They've got nice teeth. They do this. And it's like, they're clearly good because they get these results. And in the UK, your, your average estate agent's driving around in like a little, I don't know, just a Fourth standard car. Yeah. Standard. I, I think you're totally right. I think uh, even with the, the whole Dubai mindset at the moment as well, it is very much like this, that, you know, in, in those kind of countries, it, it's almost kind of celebrated that, mm. oh, he's driving. He's successful. Uh, yeah. yeah. He's, he's got a nice car. Yeah. And it's so so interesting to hear that they they flip it and they think that guy must actually be amazing at what he does in yeah. order mm. to be able to drive that. Hence, See, I I'd agree with him. you there. I think if I were the seller of the house, I'd agree with you thinking, okay, this guy's successful. He must have a really high success rate in selling the properties. Yeah. But if I were a buyer, mm. be like, how much commission is this guy making in the middle? I need to try and negotiate on the price. I need to get that down. Yeah. And that mm. happens every day. So when I so when I came back, I didn't have the Lamborghini. I got a uh, Bentley Continental. It was an older one. It was like 20, 30 grand, but it looked very cool. And I was like, that's going to give me the perception that I am something, you know, when I'm turning up at these houses. First thing they would say, you know, when I told them the fee, which we'll touch on in a minute, it was, uh, you earn too much. How have you got a car like that? And I was like, okay, so it started. So I bought a 2006 Audi Q7, yeah. put all the logos on the side. And that's what I would drive around in because I was getting pushback from it. Mm. Because the mindset over here is you're a flash git. I'm not paying you your fee. No wonder you charge more than everybody else because it's all about this, this, this. And I'm like, that's not, that's not the mindset. That's not where I am. You know, my why I do what I do is for my wife and my three daughters. That's it. It's not to be flashy. Yes, I've got the Lamborghini now, but that was that was a goal. That was like a, a lifetime achievement for me to get the Lamborghini. I've got it and it's it's great, but it's not everything, you know? And I meet a lot of people with a lot of money. Some of them have got the best cars in the world. I'm sure you meet them here. Well, I was just about to, sorry to interrupt you there, but I was just about to say, not only in the um, estate agency or the property world that this is the case, we've got clients who would buy cars from us but they'll turn up here in a transit van and be like, I'm buying this for my collection. I'll leave it in the garage. I want to look at it. Yep. But there's no way I can mm. be seen driving this car because A, all of my staff are going to start asking for bonuses and uh, pay rises. B, I won't be able to win any contracts. They're going to try and hit me on negotiation. And you kind of understand like, yes, you want to celebrate that you got these cars, but at the same time, do you really get to yeah. use it much? Do yeah. you really get to show it off? So it's interesting to hear that, yeah, firsthand. Yeah. You've you've experienced that as well. But even the way they dress as well, like they come in not like in flashy suits or anything, and you look at someone, you go, oh, they're going to have that money that they got. But then yeah. they do; they're very successful. But again, they don't want to show it. Mm -hmm. In as, as George said, like come in vans and stuff, and yeah. you know they don't want to come in flash clothes as well for the same reasons. You know, so I think it was, must be the culture of this country compared I, to. I think it is, but now I've I've gone the opposite way, so. I've made a rule that every house I go to value over five million, I will take the car. And it's not, and it's just kind of like if, if they push back, but most of them, they appreciate it. And I say to them, look, that didn't happen by accident. You know, whether I've got that from a real estate over here, whether I've got that from business in the US. It shows your hard work. I've ethic. worked my ass off yeah. to get that car. Yeah. And if I've got that car and I've kept that car, that's because I work hard and I, I get the results that my clients want. Nobody yeah. has a Lamborghini for fun. Nobody has it given mm. to them. You know, I worked, I worked hard for that. And they appreciate it because usually these clients have got cars like what you've got here. Yeah. And, and we can talk about cars, but it's, there's definitely that initial, you're a flash git moment. Mm. But when I get into, I love my wife, I love my kids. You know, I, my mum passed away last year, which was terrible. So all of so my kind of, everything in my mindset is, and I think this is the good thing about my job is in the US, everything is built on trust for real estate and everything over here is built on fee. And I'm trying to change that. And I would rather have a really nice rapport with my clients, lose a lot of clients probably because my fee is higher, but the ones that get it, I've got such a connection with them that 
the, all of that stuff with the car and everything, it goes straight so you, away. You said you you take the cars to properties that are worth over five mil. So do you find that there's a difference with property owners with people who own houses worth a million to two million than comparison to owning five plus million? It's probably in my head. It's, you know, if you own a million, two million pound house, five million, ten million, it's, it's all the same thing. But surely you know? there must be a difference in what, what how they think as well. Because naturally, I just think about it, even with cars, if someone owns a hypercar, mm -hmm. they're less fixated on wanting to come down here inspect it and just go through everything because it's almost like they've built they've bought so much in the past this is like this is second nature to them now they're not thinking it through as much yeah. whereas someone who's mm. got a million pound or two million pound they've worked really hard to get that and they're thinking this is everything that I worked my whole life for yeah. they will they will be completely anal about it and just want to pick on yeah. every point sometimes, so, sometimes easier to sell a hypercar and then it's to sell like a 60 70 thousand pound you know whatever else you know because yeah. the hypercar customers just like yeah just whatever it is just send it over to me yeah mm -hmm. but there's someone that wants to buy like 70 grand they're like oh no they're looking to find everything out about the car and yeah you can see they've worked hard for it mm -hmm. and this is a big purchase for it, maybe a first purchase and it's a lot harder to potentially get a sale over the line you know yeah I, I, to be honest i think being around these successful guys in the u.s and meeting successful people here it's all in the mind <coughs> like when i bought my car realistically i should have been all over it what's the spec what's the speed what's this how do you do it? i didn't even test drive it i was like, i'm have it that is my dream car hmm. i went to lamborghini um in pangborn and i was like that's the car i want let's just do it and he was like do you not want to test drive it and i was like no yeah. i've i've got to this point I'm, I'm 39 now i bought it a year and a half ago i was like look i've worked my ass i want that car and he was like, yeah, but you need to, and I was just not, I'm getting You had a hurricane getting, before this event. <laughs> yeah, I had a hurricane though, right? before, Yeah, and I had to scooch down like this. And I'm like <laughs> six foot two, so it's just just too short for me. I bought the convertible. Obviously, it's raining all the time, so anytime yeah. the roof was on. So then, I thought you were still in California. <laughs> yeah, I thought for a bit. So I took it back. Um, so I didn't have a Lamborghini for about three months. And I went I went to, to Pangborn to go and get my hair cut. Drove past the Lamborghini garage. I was like, oh my God, I miss it so much. I went in just to go and say hello to the guys there. And he was like, have you ever thought about getting another one? And I said, well, what have you got within this kind of budget? And then he pointed out the Aventador S. And I was like, what, you telling me I can get this one? And he said, yep, not a problem. I said, oh, God. So I drove home. And my, my wife was at the, on the driveway. And she was like, what are you doing, Damien? And I was like, but it makes sense because my accountant <laughs> says I can write it off. And the good thing about my business yeah. is I do a lot of luxury tours. So I'm driving down the driveway. Sometimes we'll land a helicopter because some of these places are 10, 20, 50 mil. So I use it as a marketing tool. And when I go to these big properties to do the appraisal or viewings, I'll take the car. So the, the accountant said to me, I can write off your payments. You've got to put down a big chunk, like 100 grand or whatever it is. If it's a grand a month, I'll write it off. And in man language, that's like free Lambo kind of thing. Because <laughs> you you're not going to lose much money on a Aventador, yeah. are you? Yeah. Unless you're like ridiculously overpaid. I've got a decent deal. Um, so I think even if I lose like five, 10 grand on that car, it's a it's a worthy investment to have that for a couple of years. Hundred percent. When did you buy it? When? Yeah, uh, about a year and a half ago. Okay, nice. But I think it's time for something a bit bigger because it's you know I've got three daughters under ten. Yeah. My wife's like it's the most impractical car there is. We live out in the countryside. Today, getting here with all the floods and everything, it was a nightmare. Oh, Potholes yeah. everywhere. Yeah, it's like third world problems. It's a ridiculous <laughs> complaint to have, but I just need something a bit more family what, kind of. What do you fancy next? Well, we've been discussing. I, I knew I came here to do a podcast, but I think you're walking we, out of there with a new car. <laughs> like the yeah. um, there's a black one at the back, which yeah. I really like as well. So, yeah, yeah I just, but, but I think when you've got a family and you become more success successful, I think it becomes less relevant having vehicles. It's like it's, it's cool. so funny you say that. David's of the same opinion, and he's. I'm still of this age where I'm like, okay, I love my cars. I want to be flash. Calling me an old man, are you? <laughs> <laughs> in a really nice and polite way, yeah. <laughs> but no. It's, I'm always like, okay, I like my cars. I want to go into the next one and so on. And Dave is like, this isn't life. This isn't what life's mm -hmm. about. When you have kids, you'll change your opinion on yeah. how, what life is all about. And that's where true happiness comes from. So No, it's true. And I, I had a brutal year last year. Um, you know, My mum was 59 and she passed away within eight weeks. And it was from oh, some wow. sort of cancer. Like re really, really, really bad. Young. Really like a brutal year. Um, and it was just like now I have this new perspective of all this stuff is kind of irrelevant, but it was such a, it was a game changer. Like I've been through enough crap in my life, but mm. that was like the big one for me. And I was, I, I just put so much focus on my wife and my kids and my clients just to be like an all round sort of good person now. And I think a lot of people 
appreciate that. And that's what I found with these successful people who own businesses, they, they get the car. But on the flip side, a lot of these successful people have been through a lot of crap in their lives. And I think me being on that show in the US, it's billionaire guy, he was like, you've got to be vulnerable. So now I've learned that, you know, be vulnerable, be open, talk about bad things that have happened to you. If you want to cry, cry, you know, you just, just be yourself because the more you try and pretend to be something, people can see straight through it. A lot of these business client, business owners of these houses that I sell, mm. they just want a real person. Mm, yeah. They just want somebody that's going to speak. And I'm sure you guys get it, yep. you know, here. I'm sure we've been through our fair share of bad stuff. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So it's uh, now definitely feel your pain, 100%. But it's it's so interesting to hear what, what kind of stuff you do for your, your listings. So you've got like, uh, what, you, you said it goes all the way up to like 50 million. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. Yeah. 50 million pound listing. Yeah. And th what, is that the one where you got the helicopter to land? There's been then, a few with the helicopters, yeah. but I, I, I started with Finding Country yeah. and those properties were 500,000 pound up to, I don't know, a couple mil. So I became their top agent within <clears throat> three or four months, but it was just based in like the Midlands. So I had the Oxfordshire postcode. Um, and we it's quite an affluent area. Yeah, it's a good area, but I only had four postcodes within Oxfordshire that I could, you know, sell property. So I had to go out and door knock, I had to do a lot of social media. And I was thinking, how can I become a top agent within three months <coughs> with zero experience? There's no, it, it's not right. I was like, I'm either really good or the industry is broken. And I, I, I give myself a hard time. And I, I, even now, I think I haven't even scratched the surface, but I just, I knew from being there for a couple of years and making a decent amount of money that it was kind of, didn't really want to work for anybody else again. So a year and a half ago, started Luxury Property Partners with my business partner, Tyler and Matt and Summer. Oh, and so this is Matt and Summer from? The Luxury Home Show. Luxury Home Show, yeah. wow. So we deal now with properties. And they're, they're partners in your business. Yeah, so they own a share. That's amazing. So Matt and Summer, they have I think they've got the biggest YouTube property channel in Europe, like 600,000 yeah. subscribers, genuine subscribers as well. It's amazing. My, I think one of my recent views, uh, videos had a million views on there, all organic as well, which is great. And so that's the reason why when you do your videos, then they feature them on yeah. that channel. So yeah. they're very selective of the properties that they feature on there, yeah. which kind of pushes me as well, because I know I need to be at the top of my game and get the best listings possible. Got it. But the good thing is, as my business partners, they will push my listings amazing and i know they get a lot of agents say can we do to and they say no to everybody so it's a really really good business partner to have and they understand social media so they you know we train three days a week and they teach all of the agents about the benefits of social media and i think a lot of english people are so behind like yeah. in us obviously facebook google ebay everything is based in california yeah so i'm kind of used to being around that tech environment and client like mark zuckerberg for a client i mean that's a that's a head start right there. But in, in England, a lot of my clients, they don't even get social media. And it's not their fault, you know, because we are relatively, we're in the dark ages. New to it. And it's funny because um, Matt and Summer have actually been down here. And I remember having a chat with them. And I think their, their actual rate of those properties selling on the back of those videos is something insane. I can't remember the exact figure, but it was over 50% of everything yeah, yeah. their feature actually sells. Mm -hmm. So it's not a case of they're doing it for the sake of just getting views. You're getting that end goal. Yeah. And we found that, which which mirrors in the supercar market, when we jumped onto the social media bandwagon about five or six years ago, and it's slowly been growing, the amount of inquiries that we get coming through social media in comparison to your old school version, like Auto Trader and Piston Heads, we now get more inquiries coming through social media than we do through your traditional formats. Yeah. Well, that's so, how I know about you guys. Yeah. Like, because I, I live like an hour or so away, so I would, I would never come here, ever. I would never drive around here, but seeing your presence on social media, it's like, okay, that's a cool place. Like having your bar set up and all of it is like, and always that backdrop. I'm like, it's yeah. clean, it's consistent, it's solid marketing. So that's how I knew about you, your business from social media. And you, I think a lot of people in the UK, unfortunately, but it's good for me, they just think that, you know, you stick a house on right move and that's how it's going to sell but it doesn't happen that way. Yes, you can sell a property and you will sell a property at that way. But, you know, I've sold houses that have been on the market for two years at four million and I've had it within three weeks, sold it for four and a half million. No way. And that's nothing to do so, with me being a great agent and negotiating at that time. Down to social media. All exposure. Okay, so yeah. uh, I watched one of your videos where you, you were saying, actually, uh, you've, you've even started doing stuff on Twitter mm -hmm. and um, you, you find that Twitter works for you and that, 
LinkedIn's really good for you as well. Mm. So, I mean, Twitter is something that we've been like, no, do you know what? Let's forget that because it it is it, it it's gone through a phase of you know it's just so much rubbish on there yeah. that you, you anything that you post would just get lost in an ether of like BS, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but how how does it work for you? Well, I I think you could say the same thing about things like TikTok. Like when I scroll through TikTok, TikTok is junk. You know, it's yeah. people dancing around. It's the I don't know if you've seen these videos recently. These I don't know what they call it, NPCs where they kind of stand there and they pretend to be like a character from Grand Theft Auto and they're just oh. standing there in the street. and they're Non-playing doing all this. character or something like yeah, that. It's is, so yeah, it's so weird. And then you, you tip them a rose and they do some crazy, they're like, thank you for the rose, thank you for the oh, rose. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. it's wild. And I'm like, there is so much crap on TikTok. <laughs> and everyone's like, you'll never sell a house on TikTok. And I sold my biggest property. I think it was at 31 million. No the way. video was seen through TikTok from the daughter and then went straight to the dad and then he ended up buying the property. So well, I think the mindset, like what you said, Twitter is kind of, it's long gone. That's your mindset. And that's my mindset over the last few years. And I think I take this back to the marketing with my clients. You've got to do social media. You've got to do the portals. You've got to do for sale board. You've got to do magazines. And then I take that back to myself. Okay, if you're going to do Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, because they're the shiny social media platforms, why are you neglecting Twitter? Why are you neglecting TikTok um, and everything else. So I'm like, I'm telling my clients that they need to do all of this marketing. So I've got to do all the social media stuff. Yeah. And I, w- I would say the most powerful thing for me is, is LinkedIn. LinkedIn wow. is, is unbelievable. By the way, uh, me and you share a common uh, trait. We both are avid followers of uh, Gary Vee. I'd say I'd attribute all the social media success down here yeah. to, to following him actually. And his is jab, 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 hook, hook which yeah. is just... Give, 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 give. And that's what I provided for the first year of doing what I do. It was just constantly giving out free content. I never asked for the business once. It was top uh, top 10 tips on selling. What is conveyancing? The top 20 streets in your area. What's the most expensive? Just constantly basically educating people on the property market within their area. But in a weird way, I was actually educating myself. Because when I was reading this stuff and doing these videos, I was like, oh, that's what conveyancing means. That's what this means. So I was kind of giving content, educating myself at the same time, which is really, really good. And that's from following people like Gary Vee. And I still do it to this day. Yeah, You'll never see my way. social media, me saying, can I sell your house? Or blah, like, yeah, I never yeah. do it. I never, ever do it. I'm just constantly trying to provide value. That's it. But when, I'm, when I go for it, you know, when I'm in an appraisal, I think the close rate for the, an average agent must be around 20, 25% within most companies but for me i'm i'm pretty sure it's like 90 95 percent like once i'm in that door so meaning i want to sell my house i'm going to give you a call Mm -hmm. and then you you're going to come to do an appraisal you're saying your win rate at that point Mm -hmm. is between 90 i'm not leaving without the business oh wow i'm not and that's very cool i'm not I'm, i'm just not like i'm i feel like you should have somebody like me in your corner to sell your house because again no disrespect to any other estate agents but they get paid regardless that you know that all of these high street agents they'll be on a salary they'll get a small commission me i'm commission only i don't get one penny unless i sell your house and by the way how much is that what if i sell the house yeah well the average fee is 0.75 percent we're two and a half percent plus VAT, so we're close to three times more the average and we charge the marketing up front so a typical agent it will be 0.75%, 0.75%, no marketing contribution, tie you in for 16 weeks. We're 2.5% plus VAT. Cheapest is like two grand up front, up to 10 grand up front, no contract. Okay. So we're not tying you down. I don't want to tie you down. Is that, um, but is that exclusivity with you then? Always, yeah. Yeah. Fine. Yeah. Because I, I don't feel, I think the marketing we do and the exposure that we give to, go, to have us and a high street agent at 0.75%, us at 2.5%, us give all of this exposure. And then them stick on right move. You know, what? why would you need them? And again, again, that's no disrespect to them, but I can do all of the stuff they do. Mm. And I have a lot of my buyers say to me, why is it on with so many agents, these properties? Does, yeah. Is that a bit desperate? Why can't one just sell it? And I'm like, that's the exact thing. But you, don't, you, you don't need a million people to sell something. If you don't have a contract in place, then how do you keep exclusivity? Well, we, we do have a contract, but it's like two weeks. Okay. Like, I'm not here to tie you down for four months. I, I always say to, to my clients, my job is to market your house for four weeks. Then we have a really big open day. Everybody's pre-qualified. 
Everyone's having a glass of wine, champagne. Everybody can afford these properties. Let me market it for four weeks. Let me have a week for negotiation. And then we get down to business, basically. And I think, again, the the opposite things happen in the UK. And no, nothing infuriates me more than when I see an agent saying, took on this house yesterday, sold within 12 hours, blah, blah, blah. Because everybody thinks, oh, that's great. They've sold it really, really quickly. Yeah. But my argument to that is, okay, you sold it for 2 million, whatever it is, in one day. What happens if you really marketed the hell out of that house? You've got a lot more for, for it. For four weeks, yeah. and you got them another 200, 300,000 pounds. What, why are you rushing it? Because yeah, you know, in the grand scheme of things, a house sale, it, does four weeks really matter? No. Does another type of 200 grand? Of course it does. Yep. So I'm saying to my clients, I'm not here to sell it quickly. I'm here to get you the most money. Because I am three times more than the average price-wise. So I need, my, I need my fee to basically be free. I need to net you more money that my fee is irrelevant. Because I get that as a big kickback. They're like, well, we had somebody here yesterday, 0.75%. You're two and a half and you want money up front? They look at me like, and then that's why I'm with them for probably two hours talking through everything that we do. And I'm like, at the end of it, if you still don't see the value in what we do, I've not done my job right. Because mm. you should see the value. Like the fee by the end of it should be irrelevant because we, I'll talk them through this whole process and it's probably 10, 20 grand's worth of marketing we do on every house. <coughs> wow. it's, it's like a full scale production Lamborghinis, helicopters, you know, we're touring the house, we go to the local golf courses, restaurants, everything else. So what I'm doing is I'm oh, that's very cool, I'm actually. building the value of the property. Yeah. If you're an international buyer and you just see pictures online, you know, wh where do your kids go to yeah. private school? Where can you play golf? So my videos are sort of 15 minutes long. It's almost a documentary on the house. That is good. And then a massive social media spend as well on people that can actually afford it. And by the time I've gone through it all, and people are like, yeah, no wonder the high street agents are 1% because it's literally photos, right move, yeah. shop window. Minimal it's, work. It's crazy yeah. to think. That Maybe they're black wants, book and then that's it. Yeah. And, and uh, crazy to think that on such a, such an important purchase, because this is what, you know, we sat down and had multiple uh, discussions about as well, that actually, you know, if somebody's buying a half a million pound Ferrari and this is the thing that they've been saving up for mm -hmm. their whole lives or... The, the company's just IPO'd or what, what not, and this is their, you know, um, uh, prize at the end of it. Yeah. And instead, all they're going to get is, uh, you know, I've seen it on Auto Trader, and mm -hmm. now come, here's your key, mate, here's a bottle of champagne, see you later. Yeah. Th mm. That's it. It's just not the, the right feeling that they're going to uh, mm. get. So, uh, you yeah. know, we, we, <coughs> for such a big thing, you have to make such a big deal about it, right? And on the house, it's it's probably the most expensive asset they own. Yeah. Like on your car, yeah, you might have a car worth 100 grand, 200 grand, 500 grand, but you've got a house worth two, five, 50 million, whatever it is, that's probably your most expensive asset. So when I sit with these people, I, I would say to them when they're saying about the fee, look, if, you, if you're going to get a divorce you're not going to go to a cheap solicitor. You're going to go for the best solicitor because you want the job done right. You want to make sure everything's clean, done. If it's expensive, it's expensive. At least you know it's done right. If you've got a bad back, you're not going to go to a massage parlor. You're going to go to a chiropractor. If something's happened to your teeth, you're going to go to a good dentist. If you fly overseas, if you're flying to Dubai, are you going in economy or are you going first class or business class? What kind of watch do you have? What kind of car do you drive? And they're always the top. So my argument to them is, okay, so you do all of that. And on your most expensive asset, you're worrying about fees. You want to go with the cheapest possible agent <laughs> to sell your most expensive good, asset. Good way of putting it. Who yeah. does no marketing. Yeah. I'm like, th that's insulting yourself. Like everything you've worked for to build this home. And now you're thinking your mindset, because we're in England, is let's choose the cheapest agent. Why don't you choose somebody that on the face of it is more expensive, but by the end of it is cheaper than all of them? Yeah. Because they'll get you more money. Yeah. yeah there you go. And it's never yeah. guaranteed. Obviously, Savills could sell a house for five million, I could sell a house for five million. But what I always say to people is buy these guys, go into their black book of maybe a thousand buyers. That is the laziest thing you could possibly do. Because basically it's saying, Hi, Mr. Client, Mr. Buyer, I've got a house um, that's coming on in Henley on Thames at five million. Would you like to buy it? I know you're in the market. Yep, let's buy it. Okay, great. Easy, lazy. Because what about all of the hundreds of thousands of people out there yeah. that don't even know this house exists? That could be a dream home for somebody. And I'm not after <clears throat> people that are sat on right move every single day. I want an emotional buyer and a passive buyer, mm. like me with a Lamborghini. Saw it, wanted it, didn't yeah. care. 
if it was it could spark some uh, uh, some sort of like auction as well right and it does and you know actually it's interesting well, that it's we, we get it with cars yeah, we've, we? exactly <laughs> while you're saying this yeah. it's the exact same thing with cars through social media yeah the biggest thing when we try and sell these cars is to hit them with that emotional mm -hmm. um aspect if it's an emotional purchase you can get them to peak their price yeah, yeah. And then and, uh, but sometimes we get cars and we 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 um, get them in and suddenly you know oh my god somebody wants to buy it on the same day and you're thinking shit yeah, we, we could have got more for it we yeah. could have got more for yeah. it we should yeah. put it up for a little bit more or then we sold the car and someone walks in after us and yeah. be like I'll give you ten grand more yeah yeah, yeah. and it's almost like. And that's yeah. why we do the open houses. Yeah. So I basically stagger these people over a four-week period. And if you called me tomorrow, I've got a house on the market at the moment, uh, 17 million in Hertfordshire, um, in Radlett. If you called me and said, right, Damien, I want to see it tomorrow, I would have to say to you, I appreciate that, but the open house is in four weeks. And you could kick back at me and say, Damien, I've got the money. I want to come and see this house tomorrow. And I'd say, look, in all due respect, that's great but so do a lot of other people. And that's why we're doing this open house in four weeks time. They get pretty like, sometimes abusive to me. And then I step back and I say, in all due respect, Mr. Buyer, I don't work for you. I work for my seller. And my job is to get the best price for my seller by letting you in before everybody else. You may offer me 15 million. The seller takes it. You back out in three weeks. And then I've lost all of those people mm -hmm. I had planned for the open day. So I said, you've just got to respect what I do because this is what my client pays me to do because I want the best offer, but I also want backups. Mm. If you pull out, I've messed the whole thing up and I've got to start again. But do you ever come across scenarios where buyers will say, I need to come and see the car, to, uh, the house tomorrow. I will pay you a substantial deposit. I'll show you proof of funds. Um, but if I don't get to see it tomorrow, then it's fine. I'll, I'll go and have a look at something else and I do. lost that client. I do. And I say to them, if you want to see it tomorrow, I can make that happen. But one, you have to pay a premium. And two, I'm going to go ahead with the open house. So if you want it, you have to exchange before the open house. Oh, well. Okay. And they're just yeah, like... It's a good way of doing it, yeah. But because... And this is a mentality where it's broken in the, in the UK as well. It's... Most agents are just trying to get the deal done. And obviously, I want money. Everybody wants money. It's the, it's the easiest thing to do. But if I'm trying to create this reputation and this brand and get referrals, I need to get them the most money. And the way to get the most money is to create a competitive environment, drive the price up, and look after my seller. Because my seller pays me. They're the, one, they're the one who pays my check. The buyers don't. We've had people try and bribe us. Oh, my God. From the, buy, from the buyer side. Hmm. We'll give you 10 grand. We'll give you 5 grand. Just get this deal done. I thought that's a normal thing in the estate agency game. I, know, I was never aware of it. Yeah. And then I had the opportunity when it, like, yeah. the first two months in. He was like, yeah, I'll give you... Uh, 10 grand and he actually had the cash in his car and I was like oh Jesus 10 grand I could do that right now. Um, but I was just like no chance we can't be bought and yeah. it was going back to what the, they do in America look after your client don't think of yourself because yeah you could get that short term money but what damage is that 10 grand going to do over the next 10 years of my career mm. so me talking so openly that I look after the sellers more than the buyers and a lot of people don't get it but they pay me you know, yeah. and I have to get them the most money because yeah. if I get if I've got a house on for seventeen mil, or could have sold it for fifteen mil to this guy. What happens if I marketed it and sold it for twenty? He's yeah. he's got a big network of people all over the country that he's going to introduce me to. Yeah. So yeah. the industry's broken because people rush it. I mm. think. So um, now we're just going to go on to our segment for what's happened at GVE this last week. Today, we have this Porsche Cayenne Turbo S that's come to us. It was stolen, recovered. We took it from the police impound, and this is what's wrong with it. I think they curved this wheel at a really high speed and went off-road. They've snapped the tie rod end. They've smashed the wheel completely. It's, it's a very bad collision. Hopefully no one was hurt. And then as we come further down along here, so this alloy was also hit. It looks like it was heavily curbed and this door is also damaged and dented in. You can see the bare metal over there. Also, we see, we see a severely bent suspension arm over here. If you just want to come around, I'll show you. This is meant to be straight and it's completely bent through. This one seems okay, but it's had a bit of a collision. So we have to test this one as well. But this is knackered. This is knackered. It's going to need replacing. You know about this one, yeah? So we've taken the wheel off and we need a wheel. This wheel is 
finished. Along with the wheel, the suspension's finished as well. And you know what else? What's going to be expensive? The carbon ceramic disc is finished. Ceramic disc, you can see the yellow paint on this edge. Now, to you, that might look like a minor, but it's not. So this wheel has a bearing. And when he's had the impact, the, uh, the disc has moved on the bearing and hit the caliper. That's why you have the paint transfer. Now, what we can't guarantee is that there is no stress crack on this. So we say, oh yeah, this looks okay. You go down the road, 100 miles an hour, hit the brakes, the disc explodes, you're dead. You understand? So for that, we're replacing this disc, 100%. Along with the rest of the suspension, I mean, the track rod end's already broken, and look, we can't move it. The arms at the top, they are damaged as well. You can see the ball joint is gone, it's left the chat. The drive shaft is holding us from spinning the wheel. So definitely all suspension, including this and the wheel, all needs to get replaced. Once that's done, uh, the rack has to get replaced as well, not just the track rod end, because it states in the spec that if this track rod end bends more than 20 degrees or cracks, you have to replace the whole rack because you cannot see the damage. So this one is meant to be here. Kadum, that's broken. And because it's cracked off, the spec states that we have to replace the whole rack because you cannot guarantee that the rest of the rack won't have a minuscule crack or damage which would cause an accident. So just for that, we're going to replace all of this. This ball joint obviously comes out, new rack. And then this arm also has a ping on it. So we're going to take the arm off and replace that as well. And we're going to recommend to replace the whole suspension just to be safe and to keep you and your family alive. Now, except from that, we have some mechanical parts here that's taken a hit. So the intercooler, there's a little radiator there. That one needs replacement. Obviously, the elephant in the room, all of this stuff needs replacing. This is all damaged. Uh, furthermore, the other wheels have some hits as well. We need to check them. And if the metal is damaged, like the front wheel, where it's taken out a lot of the metal or there's a crack in it, that wheel has to go as well. We're gonna have to get new tires all around. And then once everything's all looking a bit straight, we can drive it and we can check everything else is good. So, you see this arm? It's meant to be straight. Does it look straight to you? It doesn't look straight to me. Carbon ceramics. The fact that you can hold it with one hand, even though the size is that big. What does that tell you? It says you weight. So this is why they use them on supercars. Because they weigh less than standard disc in the same size, which means more performance. That's the first part. Second part is, these work at higher operating temperatures. So carbon ceramics, you might get a squeal or a squeak from them here or there, but when they're in the operating temps, they work like a dream. They're the best brakes when they're hot. So that's why people use them on track. And they use them in high performance cars like the Lamborghini Aventadors and your Cayenne Turbos and your GT3 RSs because they work. Next thing is, these are very strong actually. So this has taken an impact at quite a high speed and we can't visually see any damage on it. Now, what we're gonna do as a precaution is replace it because it could have cracks internally where you can't see it. And if it goes down the road and it breaks, How much it costs? it's no good. So these are pretty expensive. This will cost more than your average family car for a set of them on this Porsche. So this is probably about five grand at the bare minimum. So I can let's spin this coupe. Spin that coupe. Next. Stop. This drive shaft is finished. You need a new one. Look, it's dead. Look, up and down, nada. Side to side, yes. It's meant to move like that, but not up and down. Now the Porsche is on standby. We're waiting for the parts to arrive from the main dealer. We're gonna go to our other unit, unit E, and I've got a little story to tell you. So oh, behind me we have the Sierra RS Cosworth and um, it has a lot of history. So you look at the vehicle, you can see it's got moss growing over it and it's in a sorry state. Now there's a story. The owner of this vehicle passed away and the vehicle was his project. He loved it. It was everything for him. And what happened is the guy passed away and his boss has bought the vehicle now. And what they want to do is for his funeral, they want the vehicle to look spick and span. So it's arrived in the body shop. Now, 
Apart from looking all cool and being retro and old school, it has a few tricks up its sleeve. So I'm going to show you the engine bay, follow me. So he started off, he's replaced all the radiator hoses, intake pipe, boost pipe, everything with silicone hoses from Samco. So what this does is on the intake, it gives you more air for more performance. That's the intake pipe. So that is an upgrade. It's much bigger, lets more air into there. This is the turbo. This makes the whoosh, whoosh, whoosh and it gives you the power. Injectors are down here. You got HT leads that are upgraded. Look, Burton power lead, performance silicone HT leads. So these give a better spark, which means more air, more power, more fuel. He's got a catch can up there. That is for the engine to breathe better. He's got adjustable cam gears. We got the billet reservoir, the billet power steering reservoir, strap brace, and then under the vehicle, we have the big exhaust system on it. And what this does is all together, it makes a package that makes this car a handful. So these cars are notorious for being difficult to drive and being rowdy and loud, flames out the back, pops and bangs, all of that. So this guy has lived to the true epitome of Ford Sierra RS. Uh, it has a lot of suspension stuff. You see the strut brace here. That is for handling. It gives more stability, it has upgraded suspension, better tires, better wheels. The vehicle's lowered, it handles much better. And what the owner has done was it was a four by four, so four wheel drive. It's taken out the front drive shafts to make it rear wheel drive. But what this does is it makes an already rowdy car even more rowdy and more fun to drive. It's got the manual in there, banging the gears, and I think it will be an excellent car. What is the mirrors here for? And why is all this stuff silver? Because this car was a show car. So he's put all these upgraded billet parts and they were all polished and shiny. That was before the customer got into hard times and he parked the car up. So the rocker cover here, this is normally painted. This has been polished. It's got a new power steering reservoir. That's polished. This is an upgraded aftermarket part. You can see right here. That's the brand. You got Bailey Performance Coolant Reservoir. The, even the strut tower caps, everything looks, was polished. It is now looking sorry for itself, but we're gonna sort that out. The mirrors are there as an effect. So when he pulls up to the show and everything's blinging and the sun's shining, the mirror's there. So you can look at the mirror and not burn your retinas. Like, comment, share, and subscribe so you can see the progress on this Cosworth next week. What we'll be doing is finishing the job and then it will be handed over to the owner, which will take it to the old owner's funeral. We'll see the reaction from the family and everything else. Like the Porsche from the start of this video. We'll be working on that as well. So follow up, watch the videos, and see you soon. So Damien, you're actually quite famous for something else before uh, you're famous in real estate. Um, maybe a TV show called Take Me Out. Um, <laughs> something that you regret doing or tell us a little bit about that seems a good way to end a podcast with this. <laughs> uh, wish you started with this um, yeah. yeah so I think it was 12 or 13 years ago when I was kind of in that modeling phase yeah it was you know a bit of exposure and it just came across like do you want to be on take me out and I was like yeah why not was, I love the show I like Paddy McGuinness I was like yeah this would be cool yeah uh, went so on wait, they, they approach you uh, no, I saw yeah. an advert for okay. it um, in one of the modeling agencies I was working for. And then she said, you should go for this. And I was like, yeah, why not? Um, never really been on camera, like video wise. It was always photography, a few catwalks and all that kind of stuff, but nothing like that. Um, and I got there on the set, met everybody. And I was so nervous, like really nervous. And I was like, I need a drink. I need a drink. I need a drink. I was like, you got any alcohol here? I need like a whiskey or something. Um, how old was I? I must have been like 25, something like that. Um, and it is well, probably one of the best episodes I've oh, ever it seen. Was brutal. <laughs> <laughs> I, I still like, remember the episode to now. Like, I remember watching you that. offend every single girl. <laughs> <laughs> I had, I had no intention to, but the, the only alcohol they had was a bottle of old white wine. So I was like, like oh, I'm just like drinking it like that. And I was like, okay, I feel good now. I feel good. And I was in the, the lift coming down and I was like, Oh no, I'm a little bit tipsy. That's no good. Cause like back then I didn't, I couldn't handle my drink at all. Really? No excuse, no excuse. But, um, <laughs> Came down the lift and there was a massive crowd and I was like dancing around and <coughs> having a good time with it. Um, and then only two of the girls turned their lights off in the first round and I was like, okay, thank God for that. I know, I know I'm going to be all right. And then the second round was, you know, what kind of girls do you like? And I was like, I prefer brunettes. And there was probably 80% of them were blonde. <laughs> so they all smashed their lights off and I was like, oh my God. And it just, it just kept, it spiraled out of control and I just kept, 
It was. I was trying to be like cheeky, but I came across like very insulting. Oh my god! I Still managed to get a date somehow. Um, <laughs> went to the yeah. Isla Fernandos. Yeah, um, that was brutal as well. Just it just continued over there. Yeah. Um, how does it work though? Because I've, I've never understood the actual aspect of it. So you. How, how quick is the date after the program? So there's four guys and four girls. All four guys are filmed on one episode. So probably like 30 minute slots. And then you go behind the studios um, and they stick you on a plane that night. No. On the same plane <laughs> as the girls, but you're not allowed to see them. You're not allowed to meet them, speak to them or anything. So you've got to be separated. Then they fly you over. It's like a night flight. We got there at like three in the morning. I had to film at six. So Where's Isla like, Fernandez? Uh, Cyprus, somewhere in Cyprus. Okay. We got up. And we didn't get on at all. And then they sent us on this like romantic spa day where we had to have massage and all this stuff. And I remember she had this face mask on, looked like an alien. I remember looking over and I was like, oh, that's a, a, a vast improvement. I was like, what am I doing? It just, <laughs> I was just like, it's just not stopping. I was like, stop it, Damien, just stop talking. So Damien, we've got a surprise for you. She's here today. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> What's the fastest car you got? I'm, I'm, I'm gone. Um, but then the exposure was, was good. And that, I, I think the huge benefit about this as much as it was terrible, I had death threats. I was in Daily Mail, I was in the oh Sun. I was all over the place. Oh yeah, but was, angry women. A lot of, and oh guys my, for some reason, like what they call keyboard warriors or whatever it was. But oh my God. a week later, there was a take me out party. So it was all of the contestants were there. One of the girls couldn't come to the party. She was in Dubai, working in Dubai. She was like, I really like your show, blah, blah, blah. Um, and I watched her show back. She was on like a couple of weeks before me. And I was like, and we started talking on, on Twitter. Um, and then fast forward... Was she brunette, by the way? She was a brunette. Yeah. And fast forward 12 <laughs> years later, or wherever we are now, we're now married with three wow. daughters. Oh, okay. oh, wow. So all of all the crap that came out yeah. of it, all of the abuse... <laughs> it was worth wow. it. It was worth it. Was it. Worth I met it. the woman of my dreams, got three beautiful girls. That is amazing. amazing. She's very supportive. She helped me deal with all the, the business side of it. She's been very, very patient. Helped me with the passing of my mum. So it's kind of like... Good way to end it, I guess, And uh, in any situation is... There's always light at the end of the tunnel. And that however bad you think things are, they're not actually that bad. Reason. Yeah, like, that is good advice. Now I've got a good business, good wife, good team. And, you know, doing a, a podcast like this is just like, it's constant progression. So that is amazing. Yeah, that, well, was, that was the journey. So thanks for bringing that up. All right, Damien, this quick fire round. Um, let's go. Wine cooler or swimming pool? Swimming pool. Most bizarre talent people don't know about you. Goat's impression. Go oh, on, we've got to know. We've got to hear this. Come on, please. <clears throat> <laughs> <laughs> You're going to be invited back up to TV now, aren't you? Um, m most valuable piece of advice that you've ever received? Constantly evolve. Favourite way to unwind after work? Mess around with my kids. What's the most challenging decision you've ever had to make in business? Leave a seven-figure business to nothing. Oh. Okay. One thing that you can't live without? Phone. Which supercar would you take from the showroom to the Isle of Fernando's? <laughs> <laughs> the Maybach. Maybach. Cool. That's a perfect way to end it. So thank you for coming on the show. And um, it's amazing to learn about everything that you've done and are doing. So it'd be great to keep in touch. And hopefully uh, you do get uh, Damien into a Urus. Yeah, we'll have a chat after this. I'm sure we'll be walking away with another 4 by 4 Love it. Expensive day. <laughs> perfect. Take care. So I hope you guys like the podcast. If you do, please like, subscribe and share. And until next time, see you later.